Of course, I'm talking about cartoonists, sequentialists, ink studs. Let's go and talk to some of them now. That's, That's a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> That's really stupid. I hope you edit that out. Okay, ask me a question. Something All serious. Right, well, uh, uh, I, I ain't talking politics. Most of them are um, books, which I cut up and stuck things in, and so they're just arranged. Ah. All right. Um, you ready to go? Yep. Fine. Someone said that. No, when they saw Seven, one of my friends said that it was like the killer's room in Seven looked like Hope Street. It might have been the Hope Street or something. So Hope Street. Uh, yeah, yeah. Am I loud enough? Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. I think comics are kind of like ground level, but it's also like where everything happens. You know, like on, everything kind of filters through down to a ground level kind of thing. So it's kind of like, it's the most immediate thing where you can see actual forces in popular culture being played out to a certain extent. And it's where people are, um, actually expressing how they feel about things. So, I mean, I think comics are really important in that way. I always want to find out how popular culture kind of works. And that's on a really basic level, that's where it happens in comics. I like just trying to um, put different images together from comics to kind of show, it's almost like the history of comics or the history of the medium and, and try and show uh, all the things that are going through my head, you know, when I'm imagining something, you know, like all the influences where they're coming from. There's a certain way to read comics, and I think, like, I mean, that's what kind of excites me about comics in the future is that um, it's almost like the future of language in a certain way, because, you know, like with the internet, with the way information is being transmitted it needs to be images and words together so it has to be a kind of forming of a different kind of language to be able to do that efficiently or do that properly you know for for that kind of information and people need to be able to read differently i think as well i also think comics kind of cut across languages say so especially stuff like jim woodring stuff where it's you know, comics can actually exist without words. Some of his stuff that he doesn't use words. It, um, some, there's that possibility with comics as well as a really direct language, you know, with, with images. I'm actually doing a lot of commercial work at the moment, Clint, and I'm ready to finally print up a comic that I've been waiting to be printed up for now, something like two years, called Bland which should be out in the next month or so. And I've just been working for the Victorian Curriculum Board and doing some groovy drawings of cars, actually, and getting paid a lot of money to do it, rather than the work that I love to do, which is my own, and getting paid nothing for it, but getting shining letters from the comic community of Australia. Welcome to Dylan's womb. <laughs> uh, uh, womb. That's Jared. I'm Dylan. Keep going. All right. And uh, well, let's talk about uh, Dribble. How's that happening? Uh, Dribble came about. Uh, I was doing a fanzine called Krusty Play Lunch for about a year and a half or so. Um, got a letter from this Dylan character with a bunch of cartoons in it, and uh, sort of found out he'd been uh, beavering away in his own way for the good eight or nine years on the comic scene. We sort of decided. What the hell, let's lose money together. It's really a move away from the comic scene. Uh, I've kind of put in my innings as a publisher. I've like thrown a fair few bucks into, into the pool, into the kitty and drawn a bit of a blank. I've given my best shots and put stuff through news agents, best stuff I could possibly do, and still didn't get enough of a reaction, enough of a sales figure from it. Uh, I just figured they were in there with, with the wrong sort of competition. It's, um, I feel it's a bit offbeat what I was trying to do and it just wasn't really working. So I decided to move more into the magazine market and separate myself from, from comics. I mean, I've got 
one comic Dart and Deal, which is doing quite nicely as a comic, but distributed through show bags. But I figured it was uh, comics were perhaps going to be a bit better received by maybe a slightly more intelligent audience inside Dribble. We've got the usual crowd that we're self-publishing anyway, and we're trying to like give them space within the magazine. So yeah, we've got Edo of of Finn com comic. Uh, we've got Mr. Greg, Greg Gates, Gates long-time cartoonist. We've got um, Ian Eddy. We've got yourself. We've pulled in some guys from New Zealand that have sent some stuff over. Ant Sang and someone Rogers. I'm sure he'll forgive me. I can't remember his name. And yeah, it's it's turning into the comic section in the centre of the mags, turning into a type of anthology book of of cartoonists. I'm, I'm like writing most of the scripts for it at the moment, and uh, and reprinting a lot of stuff that I've done that that never saw print in its day. So we're trying to keep a pretty high standard of the stuff that goes in there. Uh, attempting to separate it from what's usually perceived as a fanzine. We go to great lengths to call ourselves a magazine. Uh, Mookie is a state of mind that I invented about um, six months ago. I've kind of forgotten what it really means, but um, it's kind of like falling in love, but you need a lot of drugs to really achieve it. Well, mostly I get them when I'm, I'm walking down the street or just something happens to me and I've got to write it down because I don't, can't deal with it or whatever. And You just think, oh, that's a really nuts situation. That's just a comic book moment. So. You know, you just got to write it down. I either draw at this desk, um, at the desk in there, or on my knee at other people's houses. When did you start drawing comics? When I was in high school. <laughs> Started just the usual stuff in high school, self-publishing little fanzines. I used to write for the stu student um, newspaper and stuff. I used to do uh, illustrations for the articles and like front covers and comics and stuff. I used to do big full-page um, comics and. They had a 14-hour uh, a deadline for that because they were so disorganised. Mm -hmm. So um, they'd call you up at about 8 and you had to have it done by the next morning. And it had to be good and I was using brushes then so it's taken me ages. And yeah, I just kind of learned how to do it really quickly under like a lot of pressure. In some cases there was comics just one of each. I'd do it in biro onto, onto, onto the back of school assignment sheets, staple them all together hand colour the cover with textures and that would be just the one comic and that would, I'd distribute that around my friends and like total strangers to get this mass circulation around high school and I'd get the thing back like it'd be all tattered but I'd actually get it back after about a month people were just like handing it to each other I guess I mean like I always read comics you know for as long as I could remember um, and I was always interested I mean I went to art school and I started using comics because I was trying to that's what my work was about, was trying to find out how popular culture works and trying to put it together with art images to see how that played out. Um, and then after a while I just kind of thought, well, you know, why am I even bothering with the art bit? I mean, I should just be making comics. Especially like my experience at art school, everyone was trying out ideas, but it's in this really sterile environment, you know, like in the gallery environment, which is like this white cube kind of sterile thing. But when you make comics, or you know, it's a really direct medium, and you you're actually, I mean, I actually feel like I'm involved in the in popular culture in a more direct way, and and the ideas are getting tested properly, you know, because someone will say, hey, this doesn't make sense, or you know, this is bullshit. So you've got to kind of um, really try to communicate rather than be in this esoteric kind of art world and say like oh well you know because I'm an artist or because it's in a gallery it doesn't need to have a direct communication with with the viewer or the reader or whatever because I could try out my ideas in a more direct kind of way with comics you know and plus it just I mean it felt really comfortable I really enjoyed doing it. I got feedback from people in the street and stuff but my lecturers didn't really dig it too much um, even though you've got like comic book artists appearing in um, major art mags all over the world and stuff, they still don't really, you know, unless you're painting or, you know, doing large-scale drawings. Yes, been teaching cartooning out at Box Hill TAFE, which is on the 1st of August, if this gets to air by that time, so get your $125 together and come and see me for seven weeks, and 
we learn about cartooning and a bit about how to draw. I don't worry about the how to draw so much because people have their own individual styles and they can do what they like. And we make a comic book by the end of the class, which is like a small press photocopied A5 comic book. Now your stuff uh, is sort of more, uh, could you say iconographic or something, rather than uh, being very realistic. So why do you prefer to, to do it like that? Because I can't draw real, but I make up for it by doing lots of shading. And I am amazed at the amount of people who really think I'm Mr. Skill and like my work a lot, but that's the way I've drawn. I just do a lot of cross-hatching, yay yeah, yeah, crumb. So at the start, the stuff that influenced me was like, because uh, uh, I was pretty much not being in contact with people, um, was mostly overseas, so there was like Paul Mavreds, Robert Williams, uh, this woman, Melinda Gebby, but they were all people that were mixing and matching styles, you know, like, just different kind of styles of drawing, so that really attracted me and that's kind of what pushed me towards doing collage. I get excited by seeing anybody do anything really, you know, um, so it's hard to say what I like. I would be drawing stuff like uh, drawing images and drawing it myself from other artists and I had lecturers say, well that just looks like you drawing something. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I might as well just use the actual image rather than, you know, do a second-hand drawing of it. So I started doing that, and that just extended into the comics, you know. I, I got comments like one of the lecturers kind of said, oh, well, you know, Tim, I come into the studio and you're always reading, you know, and reading's good, but you're always reading comics. They get incensed when I use art, fine art images, you know, and say, oh, well, you're taking this out of context and that's really bad. I always thought you know, by the time I got to art school that wouldn't be there, you know, there wouldn't be that kind of high art, low art type of bullshit, you know, because there's been, people have been trying to break that down for ages, but it was still there and really strong, so, you know, they really hated that I used comics, they hated that I didn't actually draw stuff. I've also got this uh, mail order distribution thing for a small press, I don't know, whatever the latest term is. Uh, Xerox photocopied, whatever, comics, you know. Trailer Trash is a big favourite. Um, I really dug this one. It took me ages to actually get them all together, all six of them, um, before Tundra got sold or whatever, to Kitchen Sink. That was just a big influence on me in high school and, you know, um, just the way he drew really influenced me for a little while and, you know, got me working pretty hard. And no Hope is also a big favourite. Um, I've only got a few of these, but it's kind of autobio and it's super depressing. I got a lot of inspiration from uh, Vaughan Baudet because of his um, his unique approach to what he was up to and the way he structures his page. Well, I'm working on a third episode and um, that's my only goal right now is to get that one finished and uh, maybe contribute to a few other zines because a few people have approached me and I'm really interested in them. Um, um, getting together with some other people, working with other people and stuff. I just stumbled upon the right guy who got me talking to the owner of a show bag company and was looking for an Australian product to go into show bags rather than using um, leftovers that didn't sell at the news agents. They were finding they were having trouble with censorship and various things. People would complain if uh, there was a violent subject in like even Superman or something like that. They wanted exact numbers of a product that they could reliably know was pretty wholesome and clean and I provided them that and that went really well so now I do two two comics a year for the show bag company and now it's in its fifth year and it's now the most widely read comic in Australia including any American comic that comes over because it's numbers of 300,000 of each issue um, hidden inside this bag kids are really responsive and send in heaps of drawings and their own ideas. I started off doing band posters for bands like Fireballs <coughs> and they were interested in having a comic book about them. They sold fantastically. It went really well through newsagents and really well through shock distribution through independent record stores and uh, enough so to do a follow-up. Oh, the band love it. I've, I've heard anecdotes of them actually acting out scenes from the comic. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just about through, like, 
sending them to hell and having them chased by three-headed dogs and that. So I decided on this fantastic idea of actually using the real stories, which are much weirder,